So, Ayer, who is the founder and CEO of Clover Fast Food Incorporated, he left McKinsey to toast frozen burgers at Burger King and warm frozen soup at Panera with visions of the future of a never frozen Clover. Before Clover, Ayer worked at McKinsey and Company from 2004 to 2008 advising the CEOs and CMOs of the world's top consumer and retail companies. Prior to that, he worked at Patagonia in marketing. Air holds an MBA from HBS, a Bachelor of Science, and a Master of Science from MIT. Damn, dude. Nice. So without further ado, here's Air. All right, how's, how's everybody doing? Um, we're going to... Uh, we're going to do some tasting tonight, which should be fun. So, um, so I just just quickly to everybody in the back, if you guys want to be part of it, we're going to hand out sample cups and we're going to be tasting some stuff while I talk. So, if you want to be in on that, just uh, wander toward the front here. Um, I was I was going to start out with this, but I don't know if we've got the critical mass to have this make sense. So instead, maybe I'll just call on if there's anybody out there uh, who wants to to volunteer an answer. So the question being. Where's the, what's the best coffee you ever had? Just think about like one experience, one coffee you had and that was the singular best coffee you ever had. Anybody want to volunteer an answer? Dunkin' Donuts? Dunkin' Donuts? <laughs> All right. Well, think of a particular experience, like a particular time. Like what, what cup was that that was your best cup? Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, it was perfect. I told him I was milk and sugar, and he was definitely milk and sugar. Awesome. Anybody else? Any other coffee lovers who got like a memory? Southern Pecan. Uh, green? Green Mountain Southern Southern Pecan. Uh huh. And and what were you saying? I said uh, Java's in Rochester, New York. Uh huh. You like had a had an awesome cup there. Yeah. And I think for me, you know, if I think about this. I might say, uh, well, I, I, had a, I had a really good coffee experience earlier today, uh, that might challenge it, but I probably, my default has been like a, a coffee in a diner, but I was there with my, with, my, with my wife and my grandma, and it was a really good experience. And um, we're gonna talk a little bit about taste, because uh, what we do is fast food, so like our version of design is designing food and designing a menu, so I'm gonna just focus on that. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about how taste means a lot of different things. It's the stuff that happens with your senses, but it also has to do with your memories, your mind, the atmosphere. Um, so, you know, we're, we're trying to do fast food. Um, and uh, and our, our big question we're always asking is, like, can um, the best tasting whatever it is we're going to serve come from uh, in a fast food form? And so that's sort of like how we're approaching things. That's like our design problem. Um, so can the best cup of coffee you've ever had, you know, come from a fast food joint? Um, it sounds like Duncan, Duncan was nailing it for you over there. Um, yeah, they, they're, they're fast food, uh, for sure. Um, so uh, just to come back to coffee in a minute, but talk about taste for a few seconds. I, I think there's a lot of really cool stuff we're able to do as a company. There are a lot of things we're excited about, and if anybody wants to catch me after, I'll I'll go on longer than any of you want to hear about the interaction of, of environmental issues and our food systems and, uh, and, and health and our food systems and you know all, all the things I think matter in life and our food systems. But uh, at the center of all that and what, what drives a lot of what we do is taste. Because if we're, I mean, we believe if we're not making stuff that tastes really great, we're not getting people to come back, we're not getting them excited, we're not connecting with people. And, um, and it's, it's just a wonderful thing, right? I mean, I think like most people, um, you know, most people have had experiences of like tons of pleasure from food, right? It's, uh, it's awesome and it engages you on a lot of different levels. So when we think about taste and talk about taste um, internally, we're talking about what you, um, what you taste in your mouth, but we're also talking about what you feel on your tongue and in your lips. Um, and we're talking about like what you feel like after you've tasted something. We're talking about the lingering taste as well as the taste that's right up front. And we're talking about your other senses too. We're talking about your nose, like what does it smell like? What does it look like to your eyes? And all these have a lot to do with, um, with that taste experience. Your mind also has a lot to do with it and there's been a ton of research about this. It's really crazy. 
Uh, I'll give my own little funny example on this. I was, it was really, this is sort of a really mean thing, but I won't reveal any names. Like one of my more senior chefs, uh, uh, well, Rolanda, who's our executive chef right here, he and I were tasting some coffee, and I was convinced that these were both the same cup of coffee. The guy pouring it for us, there were supposed to be two bags we were testing side by side, and I was convinced they were the same thing, like somebody put the same coffee in both bags or something like that. And Rolando and I were having a disagreement about it, and, and he's like, well, I think they taste, I'm like, well, watch this. And because uh, uh, he was saying, these taste a little different to me, and I was like, I think it's your mind. And I called, uh, I called this other guy over, and I'm like, you know, tell us which one of these you like better. And for his coffee, I literally poured the same coffee into two cups. Um, and hand it to him. It's a mean thing to do, right? And this is somebody who's a very experienced chef who's worked like a lot of great restaurants and, and I love the food he makes. And he tasted both and he started going on about the different, and first thing he said is, it's so hard, they're so different, right? So it's like, uh, it's really amazing, like, you know, even those of us who spend our lives tasting food um, can be uh, influenced by what's in our mind, you know? I mean, it's not that Chris is bad at tasting stuff, it's just that your mind is so powerful. Um, so. Well, you guys are going to be tasting some coffees, and you get to think a little bit about all those things. Um, what's going on? You know, what, what are you tasting in your mouth? What are you smelling? What are you seeing? Uh, what is your mind telling you? Um, I just wanted to talk another, another, a little bit more about taste and our philosophy um, uh, that guides us, because it's hard for me to think about making design decisions um, without having really uh, uh, strong like values guiding me. I, I don't really know how to make any decisions without having some value to come back to. And, um, and this, is a, this is a quote I just wanted to spend a second with. Um, this is a quote that a, actually a very famous chef, if I, if I said her name, a lot of you would, would recognize it, um, said. And, uh, and uh, I was sitting next to her at a dinner party, and, and I was thinking a lot about it. And what do you guys, what are, what are the reactions to this? Anybody want to? It's hard to be interactive when I have a mic and you all don't. But um, I, my reaction to this when I first heard her say it was, uh, that, makes like, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I, was, I thought, you know, we were talking about where ingredients come from and sourcing. And, and she said, yeah, but, you know, our real job uh, is to take what we have and make it taste great. And uh, it sort of sounded like it made sense to me. And I was thinking about it. But there's something about that that really bothered me a lot. And, it took me a long time to figure out what. It was like one of these funny statements that sounded like, what's wrong with that? It, it really, it feels right, but it sort of doesn't. There's something uncomfortable about it. And, um, and when I finally figured out what my like, conflict about this was, I think what it is is, in a funny way, I mean, this really represents what a lot of people have done with food for a long time. Um, but in a funny way, it's sort of diametrically opposed to the philosophy that guides Rolando and guides me. And Rolando's worked in kitchens with chefs who believe this exact thing, and, and he has a lot of colleagues who believe this exact thing. But um, uh, we, we really approach food thinking about what's the method, you know, what is it you're doing to make it taste great, but not divorcing that from the material, you know, what is the food you're working with and where did it come from. And I can't imagine if I am pursuing great taste how on earth I'm ever going to get there if this is my approach? I mean, you know, how are you ever going to reach the pinnacle? I mean, you guys can think about this from other design standpoints. I mean, you, you need to be thinking of your materials and where they come from uh, to be getting to, you know, the best place. And, and for us, this means understanding the food and where it comes from. So uh, this is really not how we build taste uh, at, at Clover. Uh, Rolando and I spend a ton of time um, getting to know our suppliers, making sure we, we like what's coming, what we're, what's coming in, making sure when we have carrots, uh, carrots are something that's very sensitive. When they're grown um, badly, they taste very bitter. And if they're grown organically and really with a lot of care, they're beautifully sweet. I mean, the difference is day and night. And maybe one of these days, instead of, instead of coffee talk, I'll do carrots. But, um, but it's a huge difference. And so we would never think to serve the carrots that are uh, you know, not organic. We, we don't have organic on everything on the menu, but for carrots it matters a ton. And for us it's hugely important. So that's sort of how we approach things. We think a little bit about the, we think about the method. You know, how, what are we going to do with what we have? And we also think about um, the source and where it comes from. And, and we, we give those things equal weight. Um, and we got started with this experimental approach focused on taste. We opened up a truck over there, like uh, four blocks from here, over on the edge of MIT's campus. And we opened it up as basically a market testing vehicle. I didn't want to do focus groups. Uh, Rolando and I didn't think the tasting party would give us honest results. 
And so we thought of this idea of hiring somebody's truck and serving our food on it and doing little mini focus groups every single day for two months. And uh, I couldn't convince anybody to do that, but this really nice guy named Petrus, um, who I'd been eating at his truck for years, and I loved him, and he knew me. He showed me how to open our own truck, and that's what we ended up doing, and that's that truck that's still over there. We actually shut it down after eight weeks. The market testing was done, um, and then a few months later, our customers were really mad about that and uh, convinced us to reopen it, so we opened it as a business, and now it's been open for about four years. This is um, the earliest menu I have a picture of, but what we were doing every day is um, we were selling versions of I mean, these are all early versions of what we're selling down there. Uh, some of these are. And, um, and we were listening for feedback, and we were learning different kinds of things. I mean, some of these were really obvious, and you would think we could learn it without testing it, like the Boylan Seltzer, which I, I like a lot. It comes in glass bottles. Bad idea to drive a food truck with a um, cooler full of glass bottles. Uh, <laughs> when you get there, it's a, it's a real mess. Um, but, but a lot of this was focused on like lessons we learned from taste. And the chickpea fritter sandwich, if anybody had it downstairs or it's going to have it after this talk, that sandwich is on its like 28th version of testing. And each of those versions, it goes something like this. Uh, you know, here, try the sandwich and, uh, or, you know, I'll take your money. Because that makes for a more honest test, right? I'll take your money. Uh, tell me what you think of it. And maybe they come back to me or maybe the next day I, I find them or maybe I see them sitting down with it. And I ask them what they thought, you know, and I ask them to be really honest and tell, you know, to really help me. And some people just sort of smile and say it was really nice, but some people will engage you, and um, especially as they get to know you, more and more people engage you. And now, you know, I got a little, uh, I got four emails yesterday about the fries at MIT being soggy because these are customers who have my email address and know me, and they all wanted to let me know. And I got it all like this, and we knew what was happening. Like the wrong person was on the fryer, and we were able to fix it, but. Um, it's really great. Like customers have been part of this process for us, and that's sort of how we how we test out taste. Um, so that's enough of a, of a preface. Let's get to tasting some coffees and talking a little about our design adventure with that. Uh, if you guys can pass out some of the sample cups, um, we're going to pass out sample cups, and we're going to pass out coffees. And what I've done is I'm sort of walking us through where Rolando and I started like three years ago, three and a half years ago. Neither of us comes from the coffee industry. Um, I never, never really drank coffee that much except maybe at a diner with my grandma sometimes. Rolando uh, drank Dunkin' Donuts. Um, we both grew up in New England. And uh, he and I knew nothing about coffee. So the first thing we did is went around tasting coffee and uh, seeing what it, what it tasted like. So you guys are going to get some of the biggest players, uh, some of the folks that move the most coffee. We've got, uh, we got McDonald's coffee. And I'm guessing most of you guys have had these coffees before. Anybody who's never had McDonald's coffee before? Yeah, what? Okay. Um, I'm guessing uh, maybe not so many people have this one. So you guys all have a new experience, which is cool. Um, we got Dunkin' Donuts coming, which, how, how many people have not had Dunkin'? Okay, just, that, all right. So a lot, a lot, Dunk, Dunkin's been a lot more popular, and I know it's somebody's favorite in the back. Um, Starbucks, and I'm sure most people here have tasted Starbucks before. Um, and this one is, um, this one's actually going to be from a cafe in Harvard Square called Crema. And I just picked it as an example of like a smaller local coffee shop. Um, they're, they're great. They do a really good job. But they sort of represent those independent coffee shops out there. They might have one location or a couple locations. They have a barista, you know, that are, that are a different style of coffee. And uh, so what we're going to do is we're passing around sample cups. And then we're passing around coffee. When the coffee comes down your aisle, just take as much as you want to drink because you're gonna you're gonna drink that and then you're gonna have another one to taste. And uh, and if anyone wants to return to any of these flavors at the end of the talk, we'll have everything up here for you guys to have more of. Um, all right, so the coffees are all coming around right now. So I'm just gonna keep talking while you guys taste, okay? Um, now. I, I was talking a little bit about sort of this design process for Londo and I went through. You know, first question being like, what is the uh, stuff that's out there like, right? Uh, sort of competitive research. And we went and tasted a bunch of things. And then, um, given them that philosophy we have, we started asking ourselves two kinds of questions. We started asking ourselves questions about um, what, uh, what's the method? How, you know, how do they make this coffee? Um, because we're trying to figure out how we're going to make it. So that's sort of the... That's that part from that quote, like what we're going to do with these beans. How are we going to make this coffee taste great? And the other um, thing we were wondering about is where do these beans all come from? You know, how do they, how do they source them? Because 
we feel like that's a really important part of getting to uh, really great taste. So um, this is actually, uh, this, is, this is sort of a, a fun and funny thing. I'll get into where the beans came from first, and then I'll talk a little bit about the methods. So um, uh, when we went around to collect these coffees, we asked the people selling them to us um, where, they, where they came from. And uh, Dunkin' Donuts had said, uh, you know, we asked, where's the coffee from? And Dunkin' Donuts was, I have no idea. Uh, look online. And uh, I don't really have a great idea um, either after looking online. McDonald's, um, uh, I have no idea. And then someone said, oh, wait, it says by Newman, uh, maybe Bolivia, uh, which is not where that coffee is from. Um, and then uh, Starbucks, we had two people say, no idea. Um, and then somebody heard us asking the question. They came over and said, I think somewhere in South America, I don't really know specifically, but it's a combination of different things um, we put together to manage our taste profile. And I swear it's coming from a bunch of sustainable places. Um, you can check online. And that was actually a, like, a pretty accurate answer. Um, and then Crema Cafe, the independent, told us, um, you can ask George Howell. He makes our coffee and go online, which actually pretty accurate answer too. Um, she didn't know a whole lot about it. And George Howell actually had a ton of information about what the coffee was. Um, I know a little bit about where these coffees come from. And the, obviously, the really large companies, Dunkin', McDonald's, um, Starbucks, buy in a very different way than a small coffee shop like Crema, and in a very different way than Crema Supplier. Um, almost all of these coffees you're tasting are a blend of different beans. So they are beans that come from lots of different farms, either different farms in a given part of the world, like South America, or different, um, you know, or maybe it's different, uh, different beans from all over the world. Like, might be some African beans, some Indonesian beans, some South American beans. Coffee generally grows along the equator. So if you look at the equator, that's, you know, around the world, that's all the different places coffee's grown. And there's a few reasons that most of these are going to be made from blends. Um, one is uh, that, that it helps them maintain the flavor profile. So you can imagine, like, if you've got all these different um, colors to choose from, you've got more, cho you know, more opportunity to get your, your combined color the same every single time, if that analogy makes any sense. And, um, uh, and the, other, the other reason is cost. You know, it allows you to manage your costs down a lot better than if you're, um, you're focusing on one single farm or one single region. You've got a lot more leverage, right? This approach to coffee, which is what you know, most coffee has been for a very long time, uh, treats coffee as something like a commodity. Um, you, know, you, you go and you buy, buy all the beans. You don't really know where it comes from. And you know what? Most of those people we're talking to are asking where it's coming from. They don't really know. The reason is there's almost impossible for them to know. Um, you know I, get, I get sometimes, I get lettuce. And um, I have no idea where that lettuce is from. Like, and it comes from my distributor. And they package it in a box that doesn't tell me where it's from. And I ask my distributor where it's from, and he doesn't know because he got it from, uh, a, he got it from the back of a van that came from somewhere, and he doesn't know where. And it came from some distribution point where it was aggregated, and they didn't know where it's from. So there's a lot of opacity in the supply chain. And those quotes we got from those salespeople, it's not because they were idiots or something, right? It's actually information that's really hard to know. Um, the, the last coffee, the one from Crema, uh, is also a blend. That, that one is one that you can actually look up on George Howell's website and find out. She was right. You can find out exactly where those beans are from, what farms they're from. He sources directly from the farms, has relationships with farms that he returns to year after year and goes down and visits them and tries to help them improve their um, growing practices, which is something that's really neat. A lot of these smaller roasters are starting to do. So coming out of this initial phase of our design, Rolando and I were we're really, uh, you know, really interested in that, and and um, and then we, we had to find out well, how's this coffee made. This is like a traditional way to make drip coffee. So, thankfully, uh, for those of us who love tasting stuff, almost no one uses a percolator anymore. Um, it's a a percolator just attacks coffee and creates the worst possible flavor. But it was popular at one point. It's not very popular now. Um, this is sort of. My, my best diagram of how most coffee is made right now. So you have water, and hopefully that's really delicious water because it's going to be 99% of what's in the cup. So hopefully you're starting out with really wonderful water. You have some sort of heating element that brings that water up to a boil. And normally you have some sort of vapor pressure that forces it then through this little uh, spout. And it comes down, and that 
close to boiling water, hits a bunch of ground up coffee beans. And they're ground up so that they've got more surface area than being whole beans. And you get more interaction with the water. And the, the boiling water then that sits through the coffee and falls into the urn. And, um, and then typically you have like a hot plate of some type that keeps that urn warm. And this has been the standard, this is often what people call standard drip coffee. Um, this is like the standard method of making drip coffee. And you guys might want, wonder why I'm not talking about espresso uh, or why you're not all drinking espresso drinks. Um, that's sort of a practical thing. We couldn't make espresso on our trucks. <laughs> so you just can't really put a good espresso machine. Uh, there's also, there's some other pieces to it why we don't, didn't approach that. But when we were looking at coffee, we had this design constraint, which is we had to be able to sell the stuff out of a truck. Um, we also had to be able to train people in maybe five or ten minutes on how to make it, and a barista requires a ton of training. Um, so, which is why Starbucks has some machines right now, you just hit the button and it does the whole thing, right? Um, so this is like an evolved version. We were looking around trying to learn more about these methods, and this is the next thing we found out. Like an evolved version called an AirPod. What happens here is, it's the same basic thing, but now your, your coffee goes into this vacuum thermos instead of going into um, a, a little, um, uh, 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 a little like pot on a burner, and this is way better for taste. Um, the the if you hold the coffee at a high temperature, that's where you get that stale coffee taste. You go into an office and it doesn't taste good. That's a reason like that coffee never tastes good because when you hold it at a high temperature, if you're adding heat to the coffee after it's been brewed, it's just breaking down a lot of the things that are wonderful about coffee. You're losing a lot of the aromatics. You're losing a lot of the um, balance in the coffee, like the sugars are changing. There's a lot chemically going on. So of these coffees you guys all tasted, um, this is, some version of this is how most of, most all of those were made. And this is like the standard right now. And it's something we were thinking about doing. Uh, there's another thing that happens where you have sort of instant coffee. Um, the, I got Bia up there, but they're not the only one. I mean, Folger's done this forever. and This is like a packet of who knows what? There's some coffee in it. I don't know all the rest of the stuff in it. And has anybody tasted the Via products? Uh, Starbucks has been real heavy on these lately. Yeah, a couple of you guys have. So you all familiar? It's like a new product they have. It's like a little thing. You open it up, you pour it into hot water, and voila, you have coffee. And they're re they're really pretty good at it. It doesn't it doesn't taste the same as their normal brewed coffee, but it's not massively different. Um, so those are, those are like the methods that are out there. So I talked a little bit about sourcing. You know, when we looked into the sourcing, you know, Rolando and I, uh, we wanted to buy from some place where we could answer the question of where it's from. Uh, we also wanted to, um, uh, you know, we wanted, to, we wanted to get toward that delicious one. I don't know if you all are, have a strong feeling. So now's a good time. You guys have tasted most of these coffees, right? Any favorites out there? I don't think you've gotten ours, have you? Yeah? Just got it. Oh, you did? Super. All right, yeah, so that's, that, that, breaks the, this, that breaks the punchline. So before you've tasted this one, and also I don't want to influence the audience. I mean, if someone loves Duncan, that's awesome, right? You should, you should speak up. Um, any other like, feedback on the different coffees you guys are tasting? Like, what are you tasting here? Yeah. Starbucks yeah. is pretty strong in the drink in the morning. Starbucks felt really strong. What other things are people feeling? Which one felt watery? The Duncan felt watery. That's yeah, that's interesting. So like the body felt a little different on it, and the and the taste wasn't the flavor wasn't as strong. What other what other uh, things are people reacting to? Okay, earthy. Which one? One of the things I always think a lot about when we're tasting, and I, I train a lot of our employees on, is like. Do you want more of it? Like, is it delicious in the sense that you want more? And when I'm looking at customers, it's the number one thing I look at is, are they finishing it or not? You know, even if you're not that hungry, but if it's delicious, you're probably gonna finish it. And even if you're really hungry, but it tastes horrible, you're probably not going to. So it's a really good measure. And by that measure, does anybody feel like they've tasted any of these coffees that, they, that made them want more in their mouth? Or anybody feel like they really didn't want to taste more? Yeah. You just got more, all right. <laughs> anybody else wanna? I mean, we really loved, we really loved the, yeah. No, it's not. So this is an interesting thing. Like, Rolando and I really liked the coffee at the independent shops. And we just thought it tasted a lot better. So like Premise Coffee, I think it tastes a lot better. Um, I just think like, 
I, I love Dunkin' Donuts as a brand. I grew up in New England, and you sort of have to love Dunkin' here. Um, but I, I just didn't think this, that those coffees tasted as good to me as what I was tasting in the, in the shops. And this gets a little bit of that point I was making earlier, like the method that they were using, you know, I mean, I, we weren't doing this powdered stuff. I mean, they were both basically all using the same method, but the beans that they were using, you know, the source and that, the rest of that whole piece was very, very different. And um, so Rolando and I uh, came from this thinking, well, we got to learn a little more about where that coffee's from, what kind of coffees we can get. And one of the things we found, I won't go into a ton of detail, but grab me after if you guys want to learn more and I'll talk your ear off. But we started to learn that there's this thing people call the third wave of coffee that started happening in the late 90s. And uh, a few roasters around the country found, they, they wanted to start direct sourcing. They wanted to start going down to a farm, getting to know the farm. And one thing they discovered when they were doing that, which is great for all of us, and I think over the next 20 years will be what, what people are, uh, what coffee's about for people. They started finding that coffee tastes different from one farm to the next, uh, one country to the next. Like you can even, you can be in Panama and be at one farm versus another farm, it will taste different. You can be on the same farm, take different parts of the farm, it'll taste different. And one of our, roast, one of our roasters just uh, had did this experiment with, his, with one of his suppliers. They noticed some of the berries ripened to red and some ripened to yellow. And they asked them to start selecting them separately. The same, same trees, they'll, they'll ripen to different colors. Separate them, they taste different. So there are all these uh, nuances that happen at the, at the, at the level of the, um, of the coffee grower which are beautiful and exciting. And you, you don't get to the consistency level. So like, if you think about wine and terroir, you know, it's not like the Charles Shaw where they can nail it every single year. And they get there by combining a lot of grapes to get you just the same flavor. Um, this is very different than that. It's, uh, it's more like an estate wine. And you have the terroir come through. And what it means is it varies a lot, but um, it's really exciting. You get just to taste all sorts of stuff. It's really, really neat. And that's actually one of the other reasons we're not doing espresso is it's hard to do that with espresso. This is, but doing it by drip coffee becomes a really easy, beautiful way to do it. Um, so we, we started playing around and, and trying to figure out that that whole equipment I showed you was really hard to fit on a truck. So again, I come back to the design constraints. You know, we were saddled by them the whole way. And we found these things. Um, they're called Melitas. And they're cool for a few reasons. One is they're plastic. There are glass versions, but remember our lesson about the boil and soda bottles. Um, you're driving the truck around, it's nice to have stuff that can't break. Um, they're very, very simple. And you know, we like that from the standpoint of being everyone being able to see what's happening here. Now you have coffee beans that you can touch and smell, you're grinding them, and then you're literally pouring boiling water over the top of them. And there's not a lot of mystery going on. Uh, everybody can see what's happening, you can ask questions about it. And perhaps best, you can do it at home. Uh, these things are really cheap. I can set you up with a whole kit for like four bucks. And you can do this at home, which is really, really neat. And you can go out and buy some of the best beans in the world. And for a total of $15 or $18 investment, you can make yourself one of the best cups of coffee in the world, which is really neat. And that fits into what our original goal was. This was this was the um, original rig. This is actually my kitchen. This is a, a, a draft of that thing right there. Uh, we were just trying to figure out how we were going to brew multiples of these at a time and playing around with the process. And a lot of this early work involved feedback from our customers. Um, and it's, we end up with this method where you pour it over the coffee grounds. Um, and we, we started doing this thing from the very beginning, mostly because we didn't know anything about coffee, but we go and we visit every supplier before we bring them into our program. So we, we feature a lot of different roasters, maybe about 12 or 14 different roasters. Um, so we change the coffee that we're serving. But, um, but what we do is before we bring someone in, we go and visit them. And we, we get to meet the owner, we can see how they roast where the beans are coming from, how they're treating and we hear about their philosophy. And these guys have really different philosophies and approaches. It's been really cool. And we, we love learning about all the different ways they do it. And this is, uh, that's Rolando right there. Uh, that's Chris, uh, who's actually the guy I fooled with the coffee experiment a few minutes earlier, sorry. And then that's Matt back there with the Patagonia shirt on. He's up in Maine. And that's what this coffee is, actually. He always runs out of his bag labels. So we're always getting these handwritten bags and like random labels on them, but this is Matt's coffee. And, uh, and we love what he does. This is one of my favorite coffees we've had in a really long time. I think it's beautiful. It's a coffee called Pea Berry. If you're curious later, I can tell you about why it's called that. And it's from Tanzania. And it's from one particular farm in Tanzania. So you get these like really crazy smells and flavors and stuff. Yeah. Do you have vintages yearly? 
change that much that you notice a difference? Like yeah, it changed a lot. I mean, so I don't have a great taste track. memory, so I'll forget. <laughs> I mean, I'll forget tomorrow exactly what this tasted like, but if I'm honest about it. But somebody who's better at it will notice, uh, especially one you're very familiar with. Uh, it will, it will make change based on rain levels, sun, all that stuff. And it's an agricultural product. Um, that's something else we like about that. Like, Featuring the coffee this way brings you closer to what it actually is. I mean, these are berries growing off trees, and they grow in different ways. Some years they grow faster, some years slower. You know, some years they taste like one thing, some years another thing, which is uh, really cool and really fun. And when we talk to people about tasting, we're really careful not to bring in any coffees that we think are bad. So we encourage people to think about this less as like which is best and which is worse, and more like an adventure. You know, like you're not going to get the most enjoyment out of the rainbow by looking at it and trying to decide which color is best. You know, it's just, it's not going to work that well. And so it's the same sort of thing about taste. Like, I think looking at it and figuring out what tastes great to you uh, or what the specialness is about each of these tastes is really what's going to get you to the most enjoyment. Um, iced coffee, I'm, gonna, I'm running a little long on this, so I get you, guess you guys are getting antsy. I'm going to skip through that. Just really quickly wrapping things up. Um, you know, what can you do to help us taste better? Uh, if anybody takes me up on any of this stuff, I'll be thrilled. Um, the first thing, you can just talk freely with the staff, you know. Um, we love to hear feedback. I mean, what most of our staff will say to you is, thank you so much. Because no matter what you're saying, I mean, even if you had a horrible, horrible experience, which is sometimes hard for us to hear, uh, we care that you care enough to be sharing it with us. Like, by doing that, you're telling us you want us to be better. And it really matters a lot, and it's how we've built our company, and it's, it's uh, super helpful. Um, buy our beans and play at home. I and mean, that's something you can do and tell us what you think about different things. That's like, could be a huge help to us. We've had a lot of customers do that. And it's, we found out awesome things that way. Um, iced coffee setup. Uh, I'm not gonna get into that detail, but we do not like the way we make iced coffee right now. So if anybody's got some ideas or really excited about that, follow up with us, we could use some help. Um, show us how much more caffeine, caffeine is in cold brew. If there's any scientists out here with a HPLC, machine, uh, we would love to know. Nobody knows the answer to this. It's a big thing in the industry right now um, to make iced coffee through a method called cold brew, where you basically put the grounds in room temp coffee and hold it overnight. Uh, I believe that you get almost 100% of the caffeine out of the beans by doing that. Uh, but it's something that's becoming very popular in a lot of places. And uh, we tried it for a while until we were just like, I guess starting to get heart palpitations and stuff, and we stopped doing it. And I'd love to know what the real answer is, but a lot of coffee shops, one of the big proponents of this says that there's less caffeine. And I don't know, honestly, what the scientific answer is. I know what my heart feels like when I drink it, but uh, I'd love to know more about that. Um, another idea is if anybody has a roaster that they love, we're always looking to bring new folks in on this program. We've been to Milwaukee, we've been to Chicago, we've been to LA, we've been to San Francisco, we've been to Portland, we've been down to North Carolina, we've been to New York City, we've been to Pennsylvania. We go a lot of places to visit really, really great roasters. So if anybody's got somebody they'd like to suggest for a future trip, Rolando and I will be excited, especially if it's some place that's fun to visit. Um, and I'll wrap that up. Uh, does anybody have, uh, I guess I'll open it up right now for questions. Um, and there's a lot of extras of these coffees up here if anybody wants to drift to the front and have a retaste of anything. Questions? Yeah. Does anyone have any questions for the taste master? I just came up with that. Is that cool? Is that cool? Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you talk about your protein choices in your menu? Yeah, so um, uh, we do not have any meat on the menu. I probably is what you're what you're getting at. Um, it's sort of funny, we don't say vegetarian on the truck, right? So um, it's not like how we position ourselves as a company or as a brand. But, uh, but it's true, there's no meat on the menu. And the, uh, the thing is we serve people that normally eat meat. So we pull our customers every couple months and uh, consistently about between like 88 and 92% and of our customers eat meat uh, when they're not eating with us. <laughs> um, and that's, that's been that way pretty much the whole time. So, uh, the reasoning, the without you know, without going into it in a whole lot of depth, um, I started the company because I cared a lot about some some big environmental issues we're all facing right now, and I started learning about the connection between the environment and livestock, and it's nuts. And I thought I was going to get into green energy. Um, I, I actually spent much time thinking I was going to do uh, green building when I was at MIT. I, I spent time with that. I, I've cared a lot about these environmental issues for a long time, 
for a long time I thought that those were the avenues to have the most impact. And I started learning about food and started realizing, I, I mean, I can have 10, 100,000 times the impact on the issues I care about if I can help people eat differently uh, versus, you know, building greener buildings. So that's, you know, the real reason is, is my motive, personal motivation. Um, but, you know, the, but back to taste, I mean, I think it's got to taste great. I mean, that's why the testing was so important early on for us, because I want to feed you or anybody else here who normally would be eating meat. I want to feed you something without that that you have in every single meal. Um, but I want it to taste delicious. You know, I want you to crave it. I want you to talk to your friends about it. So that's sort of the challenge we were set up with overall in the first place. Um, Any other questions? questions? Over here? Anywhere? No? Yes, twice. All right. All right, thanks everybody. Um. Round of applause for AMR. Thanks, my dude. All right, we're going to take a five minute break, real quick. You guys get up, walk around, taste some beverages over there that are not coffee, if you want. And we'll be back with another presentation.